Hey, y'all, Andy here. Happy Thursday. Helping you build a career you love bucking right up into, well, my Christmas holiday. Maybe it's yours, too, but no matter what you celebrate, happy holiday season to you. Maybe you're watching this in the new year. Happy new year to you. Last live show of the year, or maybe it's the first one you're watching of 2024, but great to have you. Got a really fun one today on how to get noticed with employers and how to score big. If you are here with me live, get in the chat, say hey, let me know where you're watching this from. I always love to know that. Put some question marks in front of your questions because we're going to do our usual Q&A, robust Q&A after the, after the teaching portion of this show. If you are in one of my programs, if you're a boot camper, let me know. Maybe you're a leader, maybe you're a resume writer, whatever you are. Let me know. Use a hashtag. I'm going to say a quick hello, and then I'm going to tell you what today's all about. Great to see you, Mary, Jose, Craig, Varun. What's up? Adam, Kim, Pamela Green, Tori Richards. How you doing? Ian, Database, Wendy, Chaley, another Andy, Jamie, Jeremy, and everybody else. All right, today we're going to talk about one of the two most catastrophic mistakes that people make when they're job searching, and dare I say, when they're negotiating their pay raises, even if they're not job searching. There are two really huge mistakes that people make in the way they advertise themselves, the way they, they tell stories, the way they make arguments, the way they make counteroffers. And, and I'm going to talk with you about what these mistakes are, and I want to I wanna, I wanna help you across resume writing, interviewing, and salary negotiation in how to not only get more interviews, score better in the interviews to get more job offers, and when you get the job offer, how to actually make a counter offer. It centers around what employers ultimately want. I call these the great eight, but they are the most important goals that any employer has for their company, simply based on the nature of how organizations operate and what organizations do, right? They serve customers, they raise money, they generate revenue. That's why they're in business and they don't generate revenue unless they have some sort of customer. So we're going to draw those relationships for you today. So get in, get in, get comfortable. Uh, let me see. I got a, I got a couple of a success stories from a couple of ladies I've talked to this week, in fact, on how they use these principles successfully. But to get to get your mind wrapped on where we're going, much of the time, and I would like to assume, and let's just say for the sake of, of live show argument, you're all qualified. You're all, Whether you're a college student coming out of college, you are qualified to get a junior level position, whether you're a senior uh, executive or mid-level person, regardless of who you are, let's say you're qualified. And one of the biggest mistakes that I, I see qualified people make is not getting employers to notice how they've made major contributions throughout their career. So there's there's elements to uh, information you want to put on your resume that discuss what you truly accomplished as opposed to what you did. So as an example, I ran the customer service team. That in and of itself is an activity and it's practically coma inducing. But what's really going on with that activity? What, what's the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal when you run the customer service team is to improve customer service. One of the things employers talk, want, to, want to understand that you've done. So if you are not highlighting this information, it makes it very difficult for them to get excited about you and want to give you, want to give you an interview. And then when you are in the interview, to simply state or talk about what it is that you've done or how it is that you've done it doesn't truly give you the power to show them the impact you've made. You might be managing the customer service team. That in and of itself is, is nice to know. It doesn't excite me and everybody else who's interviewing for this particular job or who sent their resume to me for this particular job probably has done that. What I want to know about you is what impact has you made. What were the problems that occurred? So the second major thing that people don't do is they don't give context around why what they were doing was important. Was customer service poor or was there great opportunity for improvement? So these are the kind of things that... that I want you to get focused in on, and the easiest way to get it focused in on is to understand, well, what are those things employers care about? So I want to I wanna help you understand what those are, and to, to, to show you that this, that this actually works, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, interactions that I've been going through in the month of December, 
And here we are, 2023, the month of December. And generally speaking, throughout the year, I coach somewhere between two to three people a day, each day, so maybe 10 to 12 a week, pretty much throughout the year. And for this entire month of December, or whenever you're watching this, but basically this month, I've been coaching four to five people a day every day. So I've been doing 20 to 25 of, of these coaching sessions a week. So first indicator for you is employers are interviewing. They're still interviewing like crazy. People are getting job offers, and they're, get, they're still getting pay raises. So this is not the kind of kind of time of year where you want to be mailing it in. So a couple of the women that I talked to this week, I was preparing them for final interviews and for salary negotiations. But I want to show you this particular story from Jessica, who uh, had multiple, generated multiple interviews from the middle of, of November and was in the very, very late stages with three or four organizations, three of whom she was about to get offers, one who she got an offer, got an offer from, and she was she was just about to receive the formal offer. And on Tuesday, as in two days ago, she and I met before she had the offer, and we were speculating as to what was going to transpire with the offer that this organization was going to make, make her. Now, to give you an idea of what she does, She's actually in sales enablement, which basically means she trains the salespeople. She doesn't even actually sell. So imagine how important this position is, but also how reluctant organizations are to invest in people who are not actually generating revenue. So she and I got together. We looked at what her position was. So basically sales enablement and talent development around training for better sales processes, tactics, and so on to train the sales executives. She has a couple of counterparts in Europe that do her similar function, but she's going to be the one hired for the US. And I looked at her job description, and one of the things that we did was I prepared her for the different scenarios of what she was about to, what she was about to go through. And I looked at the compensation range and I said, I think they're gonna come in at the highest end of the range, but I think they will remain in the range simply because they probably want to keep you in line with the other individuals who are doing this, this role. So she said, Karen, that's the hiring official, came in, at, as you expected, at the top of their stated range. So this is the range that the recruiter gave her. This is the range that was listed on the job description with the bonus. And she said, I pitched my value. So I worked with her on these very concepts I'm going to teach you today related to wh where you want to show your value. These are the eight elements that we're going to be talking about today, but this is what she did. We looked at how were you going to make an impact as it related to what they cared about. Let's, let's have that in order before you actually get your offer or immediately after you get your offer so you can discuss this with Karen so that she can understand the value you're actually going to contribute. And then I prepared her with the language she was going to use in order to make the counter offer argument once she received the offer. So I said to her, you have probably a much higher chance of getting more money in terms of a sign-on bonus or a slight pay increase than you do asking for a, a very large pay increase because my guess is they're going to want to keep you in line. So I want to make sure that you're using language that gives them flexibility to let them know that you are actually open to different ways of accommodating an increase in pay. And here's what she said. I, we need to get a little bit more creative because there were a couple of other opportunities that were out there that while she did not have job offers, it creates an element of risk in the eyes of this employer, not to mention it helps this particular woman, Jessica, help the employer understand her frame of mind that these other opportunities with these other organizations, while I don't yet have the offer yet, yet, but it's likely that I'm going to get it. But even, even so, for the same position, they're offering more compensation than you are becomes an element of helping you frame your counter offer. So what actually happened? They increased her base pay. They gave her a $15,000 sign-on bonus. So now she's up $20,000. She got a week extra PTO. That's another 2%, basically, if you want to convert that to cash. And there was a, there was a titling issue. She felt that, this, that the role based on her skill sets, that what she was going to be able to do was hire 
than what than what the company was offering. So she got all of that. And the one thing that I also want to point you to is she probably could have gone on and completed the process with the other two employers, and she might have gotten a little bit more money. But one of the things that she and I agreed, uh, based on her evaluation of the opportunities, is that this particular opportunity that was offering less money more closely aligned to all of the things that she wants. I call these requirements or needs. I give my paying members a criteria matrix to help them evaluate this process. And this is what she she called out, is that this is so much closer to everything that I want. I don't want to pass this up for a few dollars. So, So number one, I want you to understand that organizations are hiring. They're paying above their advertised rates if you if you stick true to your value and you make compelling arguments and you're showing them how you can actually make an impact. There is another woman, and this is an is equally an interesting story. This particular woman, Ashley, she actually rejected the offer. I prepared her for an interview. She got the inter- she she went to the interview. She she performed incredibly well. Then she was about to get a job offer. She got the job offer and she said, Andy, I need to get back to them in a day or so. Could you and I have another coaching session? Uh, I want you to help me with the script and how to make the counter offer because they came in at the high end of their rate. 150000 was the max that they were offering. I want you to look at this from the bottom up. Uh, quick update, I just declined the offer. I was able to talk to the hiring manager and so on. I was very concerned that they did not have discrete success metrics by which she was going to be measured. So one of the things she did was she said I showed her her my grid. Uh, the grid is my internal mile walk terminology for the way that we create an argument for you to make a counter offer against these great eight goals that I'm about to share with you in a few minutes. Um, it, I, I showed her the, her my grid to communicate my understanding of the role. No surprise, she was very impressed. I then asked if there was wiggle room on the comp, and she asked what I wanted. I told her where I'd like to be. They only came up another twenty thousand on the base and another five thousand signing bonus, which they didn't have. So they came up another twenty five thousand, and she still rejected it, which is what I would want you to do if. If you didn't feel it was the right organization, this organization, this particular woman was interviewing for a marketing position with the probably the leading marketing firm in the U.S., maybe globally. So this is a this is an organization with a lot of cachet and she was able to stand her ground. But the thing that I want you to notice is a lot of times the victory is found in the things you don't do. And so I, 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 I was so glad, and this, this was her remark back to me about, I had said to her, I'm so proud that you went through the process, stuck to your guns. She got back to me and said yes to everything. Her biggest takeaways and learnings from this, to be able to walk away from an opportunity that still went up another 16, 20% on the count, was I need to stick to my guns. I need to know my value. I need to be able to make a compelling argument. I I need to make sure I ask all of my questions so I truly understand what I'm getting into because there was a lot of risk involved, I felt, because certain things were not defined. She said, "I'm, I'm now seeing my skills are in demand, and I'm telling you all, your skills are probably more in demand than you realize right now. Uh, The process works. I was obviously very, very thrilled to hear her say that. Great practice in asking questions and the negotiation process. So even though this one didn't even result in a in a job, the point to me is that's still a victory because that's a pawn being moved off the chessboard. It's showing you what you're able to do. And this is a top shelf company, a really, really good company. So um, so I just I, I, I want to assure you that this stuff is out there. I don't know if you're if you're getting opportunities or if you're seeing it, but I'm telling you, coaching four to five individuals a day, not to mention all the questions I get asked for people in the program. The market is is strong. It, it really is. We keep shucking off bad news. So I want you to have some faith that if you put in the right steps and you do the things I'm about to share with you, I think I think you're going to have a lot better luck. So kudos to those to those individuals. Now, back to the great eight. So I want you to think in these terms. There, you have your resume, which is going to yield job interviews. You've got your interviewing, which is 
the storytelling and the responses that you're going to give to the questions or what you're going to share about your background, and you've got the negotiation process. The reason I wrote this rather simple card is because I want you to keep in mind that what I'm talking about as we go through the talk today affects every single one of these. There is a continuum of how you address what I'm about to share with you. That's what Jess did. That's what Ashley did. And it, it needs to be continuous and consistent across all of these. And you need to watch in each of the areas that you're actually focusing on these employer goals that I'm about to share. So I want you to think about these particular eight we're going to go through them together, and I hope that you support each other because I want to look to the chat because I want you to chime in with different ideas that you have as we go through these eight. What are particular opportunities for you to show value related to each one of these eight? Are we good? All right, so we're all going to help each other today in the spirit of the holiday spirit. And at the end of all of this, I actually have a beauty of a giveaway that I don't normally give away that I'm actually going to be giving you today related to resume writing. Okay, employer goal number one, revenue generation. Now, this truly means top line, make the money. Okay, now, it's very obvious that salespeople, right, they make sales, they make money. So that's that's one, one way to look at it. But... There's also things like sales support, right? Maybe you are an administrator who helps uh, people develop the proposal. Maybe you're on the proposal team, the proposal development team. Maybe you manage the team. Maybe you build the methodology that all the proposals follow in order to create a great proposal that makes sales. Maybe you're the system engineer that goes out on the sales calls. Maybe you created a demonstration or a pilot, or something that helped a future customer envision what it is that they're, that they're buying. Maybe you work on the customer service team and you're upselling, that's more revenue. You get, you get the idea, right? Maybe you're on the outreach team that's, that's going after existing customers to help ensure from a customer success standpoint that they understand their product or they know additional supplemental products that you might offer that could help them use your products better or augment their environment or whatever it might be, okay? So you do not need to be on the sales team to help generate revenue. But when you're talking about your activity, so as an example, I once had uh, a member of my job search coaching program uh, boot camper Dave, he created uh, a conversion program. Basically, they had existing customers that I can't remember if it was a Unix platform or a, uh, a Linux platform or something like that. But basically, he was converting them from one operating system to another. And he developed this program uh, in order to do that. Basically, uh, software uh, that would actually help them very easily convert from one platform to another. And even if they weren't his customers, there were, there, were, there were pieces of software that were sitting on one operating system that needed to be moved to another. So he created this pilot, and while this, or he created this program. And while that only took him one month to do, on his resume, initially when I got it, before I talked to him, I said, D you know, Dave, wh wh what is this? You, you built this pilot that, that doesn't tell me anything. It just tells me that you did some technical mumbo jumbo on one of the platforms. What is that? And he said, yeah, so I built this program. We had customers. They were on one platform. This was a way to expedite getting them over to another platform. I said, okay, well, what, what happened with that pilot? What else did you do? He said, I, I trained the sales team. I said, okay, you train the sales team. How many people were there? He says, well, all told, there's like 10 sales reps, there's six sales engineers, and, and they all had to understand this so they can go out and basically show them and demo and this and that. I said, okay, well, how many, how many, how many of these did you sell? He said, oh, you know, like 160 projects or something. We had a lot, of, a lot of clients that needed to do this. Said, well, what's, an average, what's an average project cost? Right, $100,000 or something like that. Right, so you're telling me 160 and another couple, a whole bunch of zeros sounds like millions of dollars to me that ultimately, ultimately resulted in revenue by you as a technologist building some type of program that took you one month to do. 
right? The, the, when, when we tend to write our resume, when we tend to tell an interview story, when we want to negotiate, we want to focus on how good our skills are. Your skills in and of themselves don't mean anything. It's the application of your skill and what ultimately is going to happen when you are an employee there, when they are going to, they are going to work with you on assignments that you're, and deliverables that you are going to create that are going to add value in these terms. So when you think about, when you think about what you've done and how you do it, when you're doing the act, I want you focused on the act. I want him focused on the pilot itself or building the program or whatever it is and crafting the best solution he can. But when he's thinking about this stuff, what goes on the resume, what, how the story starts, the negotiation process of the value he's going to contribute, it has everything to do with the ripple effect, the offspring, so to speak. Every event that you are in has an offspring of some sort. It's in the echo, not the shout. So when you're reflecting and you're thinking about what goes on the resume, what, how to tell the story, and how to make a uh, negotiation argument, you need to be thinking about the what happened as a result of what you did, not what you did. It could be why you did it. There was this great opportunity for us to grab a great market share related to all these customers who needed to convert this. You get what I'm saying? All right, so other opportunities for you to just go in the chat. I would love to see any ideas that you have that you have for revenue generation. I do see a question. How would the grade eight change for nonprofits? Alan, see this? Donor raising, money raising, donations is still revenue. They still need that to operate. So there is an analogous one of these for any environment, okay, as it stands. So let's see, what else? Any, any options? Come on. What kind of ideas do you, do you all have for revenue generation? Throw me, throw me a few. I gave you a bunch. Another one I thought of is like customer listening. Did you listen to the customers, gather the feedback, package it up, generate your ideas that went to the product team, that got implemented into the system or into the program that then was enabled you to sell more as a result of those features or something like that? Okay. Actually, Mark, or is that Mar Kavanaugh? What, what about pre-IPO where no revenue? Hang tight. We're getting to that one. That's number five. Okay. All right. You get, you get the idea. Second thing, market awareness. All right. Is your brand becoming more recognizable? So everybody in any way, shape, or form, any organization wants to become more well-known, right? The more well-known you are, the easier it is. The easier you are to find, the more well-known you can become. Right, the more popular your product or service, the more well known you become. The more well known you become, hopefully you get you're becoming more well known for good reasons, not bad reasons, right? So raising raising market awareness. Now, in this case, what what could you do? I raise my market awareness by what? I create social media. I put things out on the internets. We try to, although we don't do it very well, we try to optimize our Mile Walk Academy website, right? There's also the YouTube channel and those kind of things that helps create market awareness. Uh, there could be things we create. There could be, be options and events like the one we're having, the interview intervention mini camp, uh, the resume booklet I give away, these kind of things that helps increase market awareness. What are, what are other ways that you could increase market awareness? You could hold a networking event, a public event. You could hold a conference. You could put up a billboard. You can create a podcast. You can write a blog. You can do any of those things, right? You could create, you could be, again, you could have been Dave, the technologist, writing a white paper about how to do this conversion from Unix to Linux or the other way, whichever one it was, and talk about the steps you need to take. And if you want to inquire about how we do it and do it in an accelerated fashion, cost-effective fashion, contact me, contact us, contact the company. That is, that is an element of what gets created that also helps create market awareness, right? You could have, you, you, you could have um, maybe making our market awareness, our brand more consistent across the different platforms, across 
the different channels, the different platforms, whether that's different social media channels. It could be across different mediums, TV, print, um, internet, and those kind of things. So we got any content creators out there. That's another way to do this. So um, any which way that you create market awareness, this counts in any steps, whether you are on the marketing team or whether you're somebody supporting that. All right, wait, any ideas? Do you, do you all have any other ideas for market awareness? Rebranding, migrating from legacy brand to a current brand. That's a great one. Freshen up. It could be upgrades, right? It could be, right, we, we have different, um, right? Oftentimes, companies will rebrand. You could be rebranding the entire name. You could be rebranding the design. You could be rebranding the themes. Any other any other market awareness ideas? Come on, are we a little slow? Come on, there's 180 people on here. Come on. I love it. 180 people not mailing it in to the holidays. I like it. And Kara, if you see any, grab them. I'm trying to keep my eye on the chat here. All right, that's number two, market awareness. Number three, customer attraction. Okay, we... Businesses exist to serve customers. In order to generate the revenue, uh, which becomes easier once you're, 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 the market is more aware of you, is how do you attract your customers, right? So when, when I think about customer attraction, customer attraction could be I'm the inside salesperson and I'm calling out and I'm trying to prospect and get people to sign up with us. That is marketing, it's sales, but it is customer attraction. Customer attraction could have been going back to the Dave technologist example. If he created a white paper, that in and of itself is an ingredient that is used by the marketing manager, content creator, or social media manager who's putting it out on the internet or wherever on the website to attract customers. Individuals or companies who go and take that what we call a lead magnet, so to speak. It gives us an op a little honey out there to get somebody to understand who you are and what you're about. That is part of customer attraction as well. Other other ideas that you that you uh, can see are: is there outreach programs? Are you making are you making um, um, something that people can figure out and become closer to you? If they're buying a service, are they becoming more comfortable with you? Uh, customer attraction could be, I'm on the team that creates all the little sample packets that where we distribute them out to give it a try. Let's see, what do we got? Creating, uh, okay, Kara, this is really great help. Sweet up, market awareness, creating virtual tours of a private, there you go, pr private a pro or a product or service. Wonderful. Alex, my team did blog posts to raise awareness. I love it. Felicia, uh, legacy buildings. Beautiful for real estate. Hang on, let me elongate this. And then we had some, let's see, if you have a broad network, you can sell that. That's true. Uh, hang on, Kara, wait, let me get a uh, gym value prop and estimating customer. Let's see, customer testimonials. Beautiful. Oh, you guys are still on the marketing awareness. Okay. But customer attraction, all of that stuff per contributes to this, right? How you articulate it is up to you. But think in terms of, is there something that you're doing that's making it easier for you to attract a customer? The marketing team does this. The sales team does this. But there are a lot of other people who do this as well. Customer service team does this. All right. Number four, customer happiness. Once we get them, once we get them, we want to keep them happy. So what could this what could this entail? Well, it could it could entail the service you provide. It could be the customer service team. It could be the customer success team. Meaning, I'm on the team that proactively ensures that you are happy by implementing our product correctly, right? The customer service team, more I guess on a wider spread sense usually is fielding what issues right my thing is broken i can't figure this out i need to technically understand it i didn't get my whatever in the box can you please send one whatever it might be there could be customer support there could be customer success but there are a number of ways to keep the customers happy what are other things i'm on the product development team who listens to right we do customer listening 
to see how they're using the product and we're continually refining the product so that it has better features. It's e more easily searchable. It's more this or that. Anything that you can possibly think of that makes a customer happy, there's almost, there's not too many people that exist in a, an organization that don't in some way, shape or form touch this one number four. Uh, tools for self-service. I love it. I created the platform that enables you to do it on your own. That's a Steve, that's a great one. Uh Kara, if you got any more, shoot them in. And uh I'm gonna I'm gonna do some housekeeping here on my on my desktop. Okay, so number four. We're halfway there. If you guys are enjoying this, click the like button, share this. People need help. They especially need help now because what? Players are interviewing like crazy. They're hiring like crazy. They're giving pay increases still. All right, number five. Somebody was asking me about IPOs. Company growth. So I call this bucket, really I would call this corporate growth, risk management, anything related to safety is in here too. So think in terms of I'm on the finance team. I'm on the accounting team. I'm the CEO. I'm the C-levels. I'm the people who are working in regulation, legal, audit, compliance. I, we're getting ready to go uh, for an initial public offering. We're getting ready for a merger, an acquisition, a divestiture. We're going to sell off an arm. Wait, we're going to go get private equity money, venture capital money. Those are great too, right? Those kinds of things. So there are a lot of people that contribute to this element. And so, wait, are you on the compliant? We need to make sure we're all in order. I coached somebody the other day. She's in Australia. She's in accounting. There were some major issues because when she went through uh, her and her company went through an audit with Deloitte, they found some discrepancies. That discrepancy, if not rectified or uh, cleared up, it was helping avoid a major stock fall that likely would have happened had that information uh, not been caught and, and had to been rectified later. It likely would have been a major issue to the, to the stock. So you're averting that as well. All of this stuff is helping with company growth. So it, it could be organic building, inorganic building, and anything related to that. All right, ideas that you might have related to company growth. What, 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 what idea is there? Let's see. Let's, and even if we're going back, I'm still okay with going backwards. Cheryl, what's up? Uh, I think you go by Sherry because I read your email. Customer happiness. Uh, AI multivariant testing uh, in production identifies combination of functionality changes. It, it's awesome. William, what's up, buddy? Increased overall headcount, double staff in an important division. So if you are growing the organization, that also, to me, is part of what? It leads to, it could be company growth, but that might be, you know, right? We're providing better customer service. I'm the person who's responsible for building the staff, the recruitment, and all those other things to actually do, to get the bodies and the people or the systems or the whatever that are going to serve the customers, I love it. Okay, Kara, even if they're a little behind, because I know we're on a little delay, send them to me so I can shout them out. All right, this one, we all do this, employee happiness. Uh, employee happiness is, uh, is to me, um, some could argue, and I would not debate this, meaning if somebody said to me, Andy, having happy employees is the most important aspect of any business, true, because if, if you have happy employees, they're going to work, uh, they're going to care more, they're going to work harder, they feel appreciated, they'll build a better product, they'll offer a better service, and so on. The ripple effect here, the echoes again, the offspring of the event, right? So you could be in HR building a career development model to better communicate how someone is going to go through their career, what the stages of their potential career opportunities are within that organization. What are the level of proficiencies against your responsibilities? Be very clear what the scope of your role is. Make it easier for the managerial resources to instruct, coach, and evaluate their staff, putting in an evaluation process, making it more visible as to how somebody is promoted or pay increases or those kinds of things. Very, very employee-centric. Maybe you are the manager of the team. 
Maybe you are on the executive team and you're building initiatives that are helping the employee satisfaction scores go from five to nine to nine point something all the way up to 10. So any of that, any of that works. Maybe you're the, the person who uh, plans the quarterly events for your for your organization to for team camaraderie and team building and those kinds of things, right? Anything related to this uh, is important. Recruiting the right kind of employees as a start; those kind of things are are really good. All right, wait. What else? What else we got coming in? Introducing something new that builds on pre existing successes. Sandy, yes. Employee happiness. Ross, what's up? Uh, if you have a history as a coach or a mentor, these are the people they want to help on boarding and career development. So true. Reward points. Reward points, recognition, building a rewards program, building an employee stock purchase program, building a profit sharing distribution program. Any of that stuff will, will amp up employee satisfaction. All right. Uh, number seven. And companies are in business to serve customers and make money, but ultimately the making money part requires a profit, and one element of profit is not just is is not just the top line revenue, although the top line revenue to me is the most important. Um, cost reduction. This could be reducing costs. It could be expense management. It could be cost elimination, and and there are a number of ways to actually reduce costs. But the kind of cost reductions that I'm talking about are anything that lowers the expense. Now, you could create refined processes, which not to get ahead of myself, is I actually wanted to call it out separately because this cost reduction, uh, a lot of accountants, finance people, and those kind of folks are gonna fall in this bucket. You could streamline a process to accelerate things, which in and of itself would, would reduce costs, but I classify that under the next category. So I just want you to think about, are there ways for you to reduce costs? Now, we traded out people for a system, and we drastically saved costs. That's one thing. There's AI tools that you can implement that might replace either bodies or repurpose them. That replaced cost. You could be the HR business partner who helps your executive manager not reduce the staff, but reallocate the staff or make the staff more mobile and repurpose them or cross train them in other areas so that you are not having to lose people and then recruit new people. That time expended to do that is a cost that you're eliminating. You might even be hit with recruitment fees or other things like that. There are so many ways to do this. You could create a spreadsheet that makes it easier for you to take the data manage it, manipulate it, look at it, where you're reducing uh, errors. You're reducing right the back and forth and the additional time it's taking from a manual process. There's low, this is just, all of these are endless. This one's really, really endless. So cost reduction, any cost reduction ideas out there? Process, I guess might fit here. Yep, Jim, you know I'm going into... You know, I'm going into number eight. All right, let's, this one is cost, by its very nature, you're reducing costs if you're doing this. Um, process efficiency. So I do like to have a bucket where we we really call out streamlining of any process. Maybe you're the accountant that, uh, you know, your team was doing the closing cycle over 10 days and it was taking 10 people. That's 100 people days so to speak, and maybe you cut it in half and now it's five days of those pe of those 10 people and then that's 50 people days. That in and of itself is process efficiency by definition. It's also you're reducing costs because those people, you're not spending twice the, twice the cost. And if you're wondering how much cost you save, it's what's your average salary of an accountant, 120 loaded rate or whatever it might be, times X number of people times X number of days. That's how much you save. But anything that you streamline. Process efficiency could be automating a manual process. It could be condensing the steps. It could be eliminating unnecessary steps. It could be, it could be reducing errors. Any of those things would fall under the process efficiency bucket. Any process efficiency suggestions out there? Improve process by finding a better way to save time. With, without a doubt, you could make, you could swap systems out 
and become more efficient. You could eliminate, like I said, tasks. So when you think about these activities, and just to, to recap them before I give you kind of the last tip, is it's, so it's revenue generation. Think about when you're writing your resume, these great eight are what you want to focus on. This is the first thing you want the employer to see when they see your highlights or your bullets, meaning you generated revenue. That was the result or what I call the effect, the ripple that goes first. And then how you did that by implementing a system, by eliminating something, by opening up a new market. That's the activity that's less powerful, but offers some context and explanation as to how you did this. Okay, so number one, revenue generation. Number two, market awareness. Three is customer attraction. Number three, number four, Customer happiness, okay? Number five, company growth, all right? Number six, employee happiness. Number seven, uh, cost reduction. And number eight, process efficiency. Now, I know it's not always easy to figure out exactly, well, how did I contribute? So I, I like to, I, I instruct my, my folks, my clients, my, my All Walk Academy members, to ask themselves a few questions based on the fact that these are eight important employer goals. How can I come up with, can, can I brainstorm them? So I always say, ask yourself these three questions. Did I do the main thing? Did I actually sell the product? Great, fine. Then, then you know that to be good and true. Did I do a step, an intermediary step, a pre-step or something like that? I built the demonstration that the account executive took to the meeting, right? That's a prerequisite step. Or was there an ingredient? So did you build something? So that technologist that I mentioned, did you write a white paper that the content manager or social media manager used on social media? It was a pre-step, yes, but it was kind of an ingredient deliverable. You might have a pre-step where I'm taking something from somebody, I'm doing something with it, and then I'm passing it off to somebody else who then takes it and makes the sale or takes it and, and optimizes the website, or maybe I built certain components. But I want you to think in these terms. And then when you're, when you're putting your resume together, make sure you're highlight, highlighting these accomplishments because all of these, these grade eight, well, these grade eights kind of things, all of these are major accomplishments. That's where you win the discussion. That's where you get the interview. That's, that's how you win the interview. And then when you go to the negotiation, like you saw with Ashley and like you saw with Jess, the thing that we focused on when we built their grid, as they referred to them, is the different areas that they were focusing on in relation to the great eight and exactly what it was they were going to do and what that was going to mean gets the employer or the hiring official or whoever you're discussing this with to actually crystallize to see what, what's actually going to happen. Believe me, what, once you can envision a better future, it's a lot easier for them to want to pay more for it because they have a better understanding. So these, these things are going to make or break you. So of the, of the two major issues that I said people have, the one is not focusing on the great eight, focusing more on the activities. You can clean that up. The other thing is that you might be able to find on my YouTube channel is the way to tell stories. You need to start with the context, right? I was managing the customer service department and I needed to implement a project because our customer attrition was 50% where it, you know, industry average is 10 so we're losing a lot of money. That's context up front. So it's a it's a way to actually show them that what you're about to do, what you did, or the story you're about to tell really focuses on the most important goals related to that team, that unit, and employers in general. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. I needed to get that done in, in 45 minutes because I wanted to save some time for the Q&A. If you're watching this on the recording, I'll see you next week. If you're here with me live, we're going to the chat. Either which way, make sure you click the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this. Share it. People need help. Make sure you subscribe to the station and have a happy new year. Or I hope you're having a happy new year. Take care.